This isn't going to be a typical reaction video where you see my face in the corner and I react and then pause and, and explain. I'm going to give you my reaction right now. This is fantastic. It's beyond fantastic. This is life-changing stuff. Corey here. Welcome everyone. Today on Stand Firm Saints, I'm going to do a reaction to the Follow Him podcast featuring Hank Smith and John By the Way with their guest of Dr. Camille Frank Olson from Brigham Young University. They're discussing 2 Nephi, chapters 20 through 25. Their episodes are broken into two parts. I'm focusing on the second half of the second part, specifically 2 Nephi, chapter 25, verse 23, the famous or infamous after all you can do that's caused so much trouble between Latter-day Saints and Evangelical Christians. This is a superb discussion on how we find grace through the Lord Jesus Christ and what that exactly means and what it doesn't mean. I ask that you watch the whole thing with an open heart and an open mind. I won't be interrupting. I won't be providing any more commentary other than a wholehearted, full endorsement of what these three are speaking of. Their discussion may very well be what you needed to hear today. And I hope it changes your life. He prophesies in verse 19 again, similar to what his father had said, that 600 years from this time, the Savior will come. And then he comes to this, his conclusion in this chapter. And it's kind of like, let's wrap this up and say, what am I saying to you? I'm saying this so plainly that you cannot err. And he gives the example of Moses in the wilderness with the children of Israel when they're bitten by the poisonous serpents. And what did they have to do to be healed? Look, look at the serpent on the staff. And what does the serpent on the staff represent? The Holy One of Israel, Jesus Christ. You look to him. And why does the Book of Mormon in other places, where does it, why does it say that so many of them didn't look? Because of the simpleness of the way. What is he saying again? You want to be saved? You want to live? You want to have a fullness of life? You want to have hope and joy in life? You look to him. You trust in him. In verse 21, wherefore for this cause hath the Lord God promised unto me that these things which I write shall be kept and preserved. That's why I'm writing this. What's the meat reason? We keep our eyes on him. We look to him. We trust him. How many times have we got this from chapter 20 to here? How many times? And every time you think, oh no, I can do it. I don't need him. We are so great. We can do this. So then we get to verse 23. Now look at it in context. For we labor diligently to write, to persuade our children and also our brethren to believe in Christ, to be reconciled to God. For we know that it is by grace we are saved, after all we can do. To come to that verse and come away and say, we have to do all of this by ourselves first before the grace of Christ will kick in, is the most ridiculous interpretation possible. You simply pluck that verse out of context and make it say what you want it to say. It does not fit in the context of what Isaiah and before him Jacob and before him Lehi and Nephi have said. Elder Ballard said, it is by grace we are saved even after all we can do. Elder Hafen said, before and after all we can do. <laughs> I've heard others say, despite all we can do. If pride's the sin, what happens when we get to this verse and say, I, I, I? No, it is truly by the grace of Jesus Christ that we are saved. Camille, wow, wow, wow. To come at that verse, having five chapters of preparation, completely changes the verse. It does. Yeah, putting that in the context of everything that's come before and our total reliance on God is such a good way to look at that next. And after all we can do, I'm just reminded in the book of John, without me, ye can do nothing, <laughs> nothing. I think that's kind of the danger of 
taking one verse and setting it by itself instead of seeing everything surrounding it. Even the next couple of verses after that are so important to keep reading. I know. It doesn't change and say, so did you get that? You have to do this, 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 and this, and this, and this. You have to climb up the ladder as far as the ladder goes before I'll drop a rope down to help you. <laughs> Remember that little metaphor? That was on my mission. We had that one <laughs> passed around. And we are made alive in Christ. And therefore, verse 26, we talk of Christ. We rejoice in Christ. We preach of Christ. We prophesy of Christ and we write according to our prophecies that our children may look to that source which they may look for a remission of their sins. That's the lesson from the Assyrians and the Babylonians, from the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, from Jerusalem at the time the Babylonians came in. That's the lesson he wants us to get. It isn't depending on our own strength. It's the exact opposite. It's just the opposite. And it was the pride of the people that led them down this I can do this. How many times do we hear the king of Babylon, the king of the Assyrians, Lucifer saying, I, 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 I'm the great one. No, we cannot do it without him. So here's Elder Ballard. He said, it is only through the infinite atonement of Jesus Christ that people can overcome the consequences of bad choices. Thus, Nephi teaches us that is ultimately by the grace of Christ that we are saved, even after all we can do. No matter how hard we work, no matter how much we obey, no matter how many good things we do in this life, it would not be enough were it not for Jesus Christ and his loving grace. Now, you go on to say, so what is all we can do? That's another way to look at this. What is all we can do? Cross-reference from that Second Nephi twenty five twenty three to Alma twenty four verse eleven. Alma twenty four clear ahead where we've got the king of the anti Nephi Lehi's, the people of Ammon. Using exactly the same words. I'm so glad you're it's bringing ex- this up. Exactly the same words. They have found Jesus Christ. They have con- truly converted. This is right as they're ready to bury their weapons of war in the ground and make covenants again and again, saying, we will give our lives rather than ever turn from him. And verse 11, here is the king of those converted Lamanites. And he said, and now behold, my brethren, since it had been all that we could do, it has been all all that we could do as we were the most lost of all mankind to repent of all our sins and the many murders we have done. What is all we can do? It is to repent, to return to the Holy One of Israel, to overcome Babylon and come back to him, to come to a true knowledge of the Redeemer Jesus Christ and to follow him. That's all we can do. But we'll get to King Benjamin pretty soon. We'll be there. And he's saying, even when we do that, we are blessed. So we're more indebted to him. Of what have we to boast? And that it is only through the grace of Jesus Christ that we are saved. And I think back on what we have had in this book and the testimony of Jesus Christ and what he has done for us and what he continues to do for us. It is overwhelming to me to recognize that it is in recent years that we have really embraced what it means to have this gift. President Nelson has asked us to find a savior in here. And you say, oh, he's everywhere. He's in everything. And the more we look, the more we will find him. Accepting the grace of Jesus Christ is not a weakness. It's not, oh, I've got to work as hard as I can, so then then he can make up the difference. I don't want to be weak. In a legalistic world filled with warnings about being taken advantage of, we struggle to accept that Christ gives us more, infinitely more than we can ever repay. We try to get our heads and hearts around the Savior's gift of enabling power. In our modern world, this seems just too good to be true. In contrast to pay as you go and earn what you receive, and it's better to give than to receive, we encounter the doctrine of grace and we get confused. Grace requires us to look beyond the treasures of a fallen world. It demands our focus to be on the one whose power, knowledge, and love supersede the great accomplishments that all the core horrors and knee horrors can muster. 
accepting the grace of Jesus Christ is not a weakness. It's not, I couldn't do all that I could, so Jesus had to step in. Accepting the grace of Jesus Christ is not a weakness. It is our only strength. In all that we want to do, his gift intercedes to support and enable. We can put our trust in the Lord and his unique and essential gift of the atonement. We'll stop trying to cover our sins, but turn them over to the Savior, accepting his generous offer of repentance in return. We can more consciously acknowledge his strength and wisdom in all our successes. I was sitting on a plane in exotic New Jersey, and a guy came down the aisle with a Vote for Pedro shirt on, and he said, why are you so dressed up? And I said, I've just been speaking to some missionaries in my church. And he said, really? So have I. He was an evangelical minister, and he said, I saw his book by Robert L. Millett called A Different Jesus, and I said, I know him. You know how he and Greg Johnson do that, a Mormon and evangelical in conversation? I said, why don't we do that? And he said, okay. And he said, you guys believe in the Jesus of the gaps. He said, you think you're going to do all this, and then Jesus makes up the difference at the end. And I thought, oh, I know where you got that idea. Guess what verse he's going to come to. Yeah, yeah, guess what verse he's thinking. Like, it's a sequence. After all we can do, okay, let's add up your points. And, and so many recently have addressed this. And he said, if you never went to the temple again, could you be saved? And I said, I go to the temple because I think the Lord wants me to. But the temple is not the Savior. Jesus is the Savior. My mission is not the Savior. Jesus is my Savior. My keeping the word of wisdom is not the Savior. Jesus is my Savior. And King Benjamin says, we are all beggars. There's none of us who can say, no, nope, God let me in. I got all the points. I did everything I could um, do. Yeah, right. <laughs> we are all in the position of a beggar, all of us. I went home and I looked up every occurrence of the word merits in the Book of Mormon. I found some awesome verses relying solely and only upon the merits of Christ. And I'm so glad I sat by him because it helped me so much to get all of these verses together. Because none of those references have anything to do with us. It's not our merits. It's always the Savior's merits. That's scripture. And we can be willing, but he is able. The, the only thing we are ever called in the scripture, as far as I can see, is willing. But he is able to do his work. But we can try and then mess up and try again next week because he's so merciful. He says, come back to the sacrament table next week. It'll still be here. Camille, could I ask you to do something very difficult? Let's say that there's someone folding laundry right now listening or someone on their commute is listening. They're thinking, I have to do everything I can possibly do so I can receive exaltation. I have to. I've been taught that, you know, in Sunday school and seminary. And I have to run faster than I have strength. I have to. I have to. <laughs> and then will you do me a favor, Camille, and sit in that laundry room or sit in the passenger seat of the car? How would you help someone break out of that paradigm into this one where you have some freedom to rely <laughs> on someone else. I would tell her, does she know how much the Lord loves her? Does she know how much he sees her and all that she tries to do to help others? Does she recognize that the Lord has enabling power to allow us to do the things that he needs us to do, that he will not leave us comfortless, that he's merciful? When we stumble, he delights in us trying to follow him but we will stumble. And when we stumble, he is there to take our hand, just like Peter as he fell in the depths of the sea. Immediately, he stretched forth his hand, and he does that for us. He calls that progress. It's not failure. It is progress. We come closer to him, and he delights in our hearts and our desire for us to serve him, but he does not intend for us to take the load of everything upon us. We are to be joyful and to find joy. I just think there is something so profound about the opportunity we have to pray and to ask our Father in heaven to help us. Where where do you need me today? And there are mundane things that have to be done, but we do that and, and just, just say, oh, if I can have him with me as I fold laundry and sing of him and sing praises to him. And you know, sometimes the laundry doesn't get finished, but there's someone there that needs my me to be with them and to listen to them. I would ask her to learn to hear the voice of the Lord through his spirit so that she can know when she has to make some choices that mean some things don't get done, that the Lord is happy with what she has done. 
and she's doing good things to help others. So we live in a fallen earth and things are not perfect. And not only do we stumble and fall, we don't ever get that to-do list. To-do lists are wonderful for certain things to just kind of go, all right, I got to remember this. But it isn't our rule. And if we let a to-do list determine our day-to-day, our minute-by-minute schedule, we'll be miserable to live with and we'll be miserable in our own life. Let's turn our life over to the Lord and trust him that he really will help us and lead us to what we need to be doing and to let go of the things that don't get done today. That laundry will still be there tomorrow. We'll get to it eventually. But God loves her and and she needs to know that and she needs to know and hear that from him. Not from me or from anyone else. She needs to hear it from yeah, it's like putting deadlines on it. It's a happy, joyful way of life. And and if it isn't, then our focus is off. I frequently tell my children, none of this stuff we do saves us. Going to church, you know, not watching that movie, going to the temple, you know, none of this stuff saves me. I'm not trying to earn anything with this. And then their automatic question is, well, then why do we do it at all? <laughs> if Jesus is going to save me, why do I have to do anything? Feels like the right thing to say. I hope it is. I say, I do these things, not because I hope the doors of heaven will open to me if I do them, but because the doors of heaven are open to me. I do these things, so I'll want to walk through those doors because those things change who I am inside. So Camille, if someone's in there going, I got to do all I can, I got to do all, all I can, you're in the right place. The doors of heaven are wide open to you and you want to go inside. And the path is there. And he is the path. He is the rod. He is the tree. He's our guide. He's our judge. He's our advocate. Yes. We're not left alone. And I think, yeah, I think what you point out, motive is so important. Why am I doing this? And if it's to get points, it's pretty miserable. We obey because we love the Lord. Uh, We love our families. We want to serve Not because we hope we get noticed or because that makes us closer to the tree in our estimation. It is because we love and we want to be like him and that's what he would do. I like the word striving, but I think we don't strive in a worried way as if we're trying to earn something. We've come to Christ and now we want to become like Christ because we love him. We strive, but the striving isn't the formula for salvation. The striving is kind of like a fruit of it. Camille, how wonderful that you walked us through those Isaiah chapters that led us to this verse. And if you come to the conclusion that Nephi's like, okay, you better rely on yourself. You just missed what the message was to Israel and Judah, all of these chapters were the whole reason you're going to be scattered is because you do rely on yourself. When I discovered the word merits in the Book of Mormon and how we're saved by Christ's merits, and not, it was a different paradigm. It was that I hope you earn enough to sit in the eagle's nest. Jesus knows I'm Christian. He knows I rely on him. And he, he knows I know he is not my last hope. He's my only hope. He knows that. I'd like to just quick comment on this quote from Elder Ballard, where he says, Unfortunately, there are some within the church who have become so preoccupied with performing good works that they forget that those works, as good as they are, are hollow unless they are accompanied by a complete dependence on Christ. How do you do both? How do you say, you know what? I want to do a lot. I'm going to do a lot. I'm going to do what I can do, but I rely completely on him. That's a different paradigm to I've got to earn my way. Yeah, it is very different. And I think part of it is recognizing his hand in our successes, acknowledging that we have received his enabling power today to do what I have been able to accomplish. Can we give credit where credit is due? And to look back and to see, oh, I could never have done that without him. It's one of the real blessings I'm finding about getting older. You have more of life to look back on and more of a perspective to see the way the Lord has shaped your life has been there time and time and time again, and that you cannot take credit for it, that our lives become witnesses of the grace of Jesus Christ. Hopefully the blessing that this has been to you, learning from Dr. Olson, this profound truth, all of what she taught us, 
leading up to that verse, it is by grace that we are saved. 